Now again, folks, Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. We're going to review today for a couple of seconds 30 verses in chapter 1 of the book of Philippians. We're going to just make a quick review of those. I'm going to try to do those in 30 minutes. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ. The first and most important thing uh, in this here is is we can put a union together. Paul and Timothy. Here's two guys that have asked Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sin, come in their heart, save their soul, and they're going to follow God with all of their might. Now what he's saying here, that because they are, they are servants of Jesus Christ. Well, what does a servant do? A servant does what his master uh, directs him to do. Now, how can you do what Jesus directs you to do if you don't know what he directs you to do? So this is what we're going to see. He's writing to all of the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi. So here's Timothy and Paul, and they are together, and Paul's probably saying to Timothy, uh, pen this down for me, I'm going to say it, and you write it down. And uh, Timothy was an, an intelligent young man, and I'm sure that he wrote it down. Now he says, this is what, who we're writing to. We're writing to the saints in Jesus Christ, which are at Philippi. Those people that were at Philippi he was writing to were those who had said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. So, because he was writing this to Christians, that means that you and I, we may not live in the Philippians, I mean, the, in, in Philippi, over there in the East, Middle East, we may not live in Greece. We may not live in... Well, I don't know where you live or where I live. doesn't matter. It's that we live somewhere else besides where this was being written. But he's saying this is written for you. Now, wherever you are, you follow this. If you're a bishop, which is a pastor, or if you're a deacon, which is the man that helps the pastor and prays for the pastor and does a work for the pastor. A pastor needs many deacons. Why? Because he's one man and he can't go out in all of the places all the time. It just In this day and age, where does the pastor have to go much of the time? Hospitals. The little town we live in, we have a hospital. The next little town up the road has a hospital. Our members end up in this hospital in this town. They end up in the hospital in the next town. And then what happens? They have to go to the big metropolis, a big city near us, that has a, a conglomeration of doctors and hospitals for special needs. So now you have members scattered out here and there and further out. The preacher can't go to all of them. So what does he do? He has faithful men called deacons or that come and they do what the preacher wants. In different churches, they call them different things. In our particular church, we uh, follow this word that Paul put here in the book. He called them deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's making a statement. He's writing to these pastors and to these new deacons. And he's telling them, hey, I love you. And I want grace to be unto you. You and I say, have a good day. And Paul's saying, I'm praying the grace of God will be in you this day and it will be a good day for you. And uh, he said, uh, from our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the Father sitting on his throne in heaven, sent one part of his self, the Son, down here to be physically seen on this earth and at that point in time had been, and now he was gone, but he was with us because we asked him to come into us. We said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in and save my soul. And he came into you and saved your soul. Now he lives in you. Now, Paul's saying, I ask the, the Father 
to Abraham in thanksgiving. Grace be unto you, he said, peace from our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you lately sat down and wrote a letter to your preacher? Have you ever wrote a letter to your preacher? Have you ever wrote a letter to one of the deacons? Have you ever wrote a letter, period? Boy, do I fail. I absolutely, positively, 100% fail in what I'm challenging you in this morning. Or today. I fail. I have not wrote my Sunday school class this year. I usually, every year, I sit down and I write a letter to every single one of my boys in my Sunday school class and put it in the mail so they get it in the mail. And they can say, hey, I got a letter from, from Brother Peter when I was in the fifth grade. And this is what he said. Keep up the good work. He challenged me to stay in my Bible on a daily basis. He challenged me the same as he does in Sunday school to love my life as it is right now at, in the fifth grade and to excel in it. And this is what we ought to do. We ought to chide on those that are in the ministry. Have you seen a deacon do something that you thought, wow, that is a real deacon? Write him a letter and put it in the mailbox. You say, well, I'm going to see him Sunday. That's not the same. Not at all. Not the same. Hey, hey, do you appreciate your preacher? Write a letter. And send it to him. You say, well, I can do that. It would be nice if I could put something in it. Well, if you're a poor man, uh, put him something for a cup of coffee in the morning or something. Uh, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Now, this is a man that started some work in another town. And right now, he's gone and he's perhaps in prison in Roma somewhere. And he's praying for these other people. Always, in every prayer of mine, for you all. Making requests with joy. So, he continually, every day, and I can see Paul praying constantly. Can you think of a better thing to do? You leave Jerusalem. And you're walking. And you're going to Bethsaida. 25 miles. You're walking 25 miles. Can you think of anything better to do than to have your mind on Jesus? To have your mind on those that you've won to the Lord? To be talking to the Lord and praying for them? And walking along? Next thing you know, you're in Bethsaida. You say, my goodness, 25 miles and I made it already. Because you had your mind on others. If you had your mind on yourself, you could become to drudgery. Your steps could become drudgery. But if you got your mind on somebody else instead of your steps and you're just naturally walking, before you know it, you're where you're headed. And that's the way life is today. If we have our thoughts, truly our thoughts on others and praying for others, we'll forget the things that we have. <laughs> Hey, I've been hurt a couple times in the last week. Quite seriously hurt. But my concern was not for me. At the time I got hurt, I was doing for others. And I let that slide, and God took care of it. He mended the hurt. A couple of times, he's mended the hurt. Because I didn't let the hurt change my attitude toward what I was doing for others. He said, I'm being confident in this very thing. That he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That means that you are held 
in the arms, in the heart, in the bosom of Jesus Christ until the day that you meet him face to face. Until the day you meet him face to face. In this case, this was uh, about two or three thousand years ago. But uh, Timothy has already met the Lord face to face. And one day, he will come to the place to where all of us, including him, will go into a new Jerusalem, into a new place, into a new earth, into all of the new things. But right now, whatever's going on in heaven is going on in the presence of God. And Timothy's there, and my mother's there, and my father's there, and many other people I know are there. Even as it is meet or necessity for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, insomuch as both in my bonds and in difference of... <laughs> confirmation of the gospel that you are all partakers of my grace and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge in all judgment let me tell you what many times Paul was hanging in the prison when he was doing this praying. He was in bonds. Had his head in a stock like this and they put the board down on his neck. And he's got to stand there with his body and bend over like that with his neck through there. How much relaxing do you think his body can do without breaking his neck or cutting his air off? What wicked, wicked treatment people had to go through in that day considered punishment for something. Paul was being punished because he believed in Jesus. He was being persecuted most of the time by the Jewish people and he himself was a Jew. And he was being persecuted by those people that were doing that. And and that you may approve things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and the praise of God. The glory and the praise of God. This is what we need in our life. We need the glory and the praise of God continually. If we will glory in God and we will praise Him continually. And think of others. Continually. We will come out. Verse 12 is a verse of triumph. He said, But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. He's triumphing in his bonds. He's in bonds, and yet he's triumphing. He's praying for these guys. Just because they strapped his body down didn't, didn't hurt, bother his heart and his mind. His heart and his mind. You know what Paul said? He said, I have learned in whatever state that I'm in to rejoice in the Lord. Many years ago, I had to learn that process. Woo! 
knew I used to be a cry. A cry. I'd cry and complain, Whoa, is me. There ain't nobody on the earth having the heart as I got it. Whoa, is me. You know what the Lord said? He said, If you were praising me, why you got this flat tire? No tire, no money. <laughs> no way to change it. If you were praising me, I'll make a way for you. And he's always has, always has for me. He's always made a way for me. Triumph. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the place and in all other places. In all the place where you are, because I've been in bonds, it has profited you to be able to say, well, if he can praise the Lord in bonds, I'll be able to. And he said, not only with you, brethren, but I do this with all the brethren. I got them all over the place. Everywhere I've been, I've left a testimony, and I've, I've held true to it. And many of the brethren in the Lord wax confident by my bonds. He's saying, because I've been willing to not complain about being in these bonds, because I've been willing, many of the other brethren have been willing and learned to come about it. I'm much more bold to speak the word without fear. And he said, because of my bonds, they've got more bold, so they'll speak the words. Do you know what this refers to? It refers to overcoming. Overcoming. We need to be overcoming. We have a tendency today to be silent. I consider myself a soul winner. A very poor one at that. Uh, I read books about real soul winners. Real guys that really want, I mean, I mean daily, I mean daily. Their, their fever and their favor and their, their life. It was like Paul the Apostle right here. And, and, and went about winning souls daily, 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 daily. I have much contact, but not a whole lot of soul winning lately. I've got to get back, get back, get back, get back, get back, get back there doing what I need to do. And boldly speak. Some indeed preach Christ even under strife, and some also under goodwill. The one preached Christ as a contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, and the and knowledge that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Never notwithstanding, every way, whether in patience or in truth. Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yes, and will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the a supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Here's a man that says, I'm ready to die, if need be. Be life or death, he said, I'm ready to go, and uh, that's it. For to me to live, he said, is Christ, and to die is gain. Hey, to live on this earth, the few little years that we're going to live on this earth, to live on this earth these few little years is nothing compared to what heaven's going to be forever. 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 Our problem is, is <laughs> we think this is it. 
Well, I got news for you. This ain't it. This is a temporary place. And what we're supposed to do, Paul said right here, in verse 23, I'm in a strait. <laughs> there he is. His neck's in bones. Let's say that. And he's standing with his body behind this board. And he's standing up and his neck's in bone. All he had to do is release his knees a little bit and sag down. And it would cut that windpipe off. And he could have gone on to heaven. But he said, no. No, I'm not going to do that. It's needful for me to stay, so I'm going to fight it. I'm going to stand as long as I can stand. I'm standing here. I'm going to keep my feet, keep my legs straight up, and I'm going to stand here. Can you imagine the pain and the, the misery and the, the, the fight that a man would have on just giving up and just go ahead and slump down and go on and leave this earth? And, but he didn't do that. So he was in that strait, he said, he referred. The pressure was equal on him, uh, and the experience was wicked at the time. And he was being pressed on both sides. The Lord was saying, now, Paul, I need you to hang around a little while longer, if you would, and bear up under this, because the desire that I gave you in your heart is to proclaim the gospel to others until the day you die. So that he said, where he said in that 23, he said, I had the desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. He knew it was, and it would have been so easy for him to do it, and nobody would ever know the difference. They would say, well, they killed Paul. They put him in the stocks, and it killed him. The centerpiece of Paul's total life is Christ. If one could draw any kind of conclusion about Paul the Apostle, it would be the center of his life was Jesus Christ. This was a man that never took a wife. Jesus was his center point in his life. And he did all of that so that what, the place that he has, the position he has in heaven, I'm sure, is one of great. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, know that I shall abide and continue with you for your furtherance and joy of faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Christ Jesus for me by my coming to you again. Verse 26. He's saying, I got the opportunity right here just to go on to heaven. Or I can bear up under this thing, keep shifting my feet, stretching my legs, and pushing my body up. Pulling with my arms. His hands was in stocks too. Can you see the picture? They put him between these two boards. It's got these two holes where your arms, your hands are and your wrists are. And the boards are tight. And the other one's tight on your neck. And your body's standing up. And you're there. Can you see how easy it would have been? How much easier it would have been to just give up. Fall down. And be dead in within a second or two. But he was in the strait. He said, no, I can't do that. That would be the very easy thing for me to do. I'm not going to do it. He said, I'm not, I, it's needful for me to stay with you. And he said, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's referring here to their behavior. When it says conversation, and we've crossed this bridge when we were doing our 15 excerpts on Philippians, that conversation in the Bible doesn't mean what you say necessarily with your mouth. It's what you do with your body. 
Paul's conversation and his mannerisms with his body was perfect. He allowed himself to be to go through all of these problems and come out on the other end. Always thinking and looking at the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus hung on a cross that he could have bypassed. Had he bypassed it, you and I would not have salvation. But he said, for you and I, he said, just for you, Brother Peter, just for you, Peter, I will go to the cross. I will let them nail me up to this cross. I will let them nail my feet. I will hang on this cross until death. And I will raise on the third day to give you the salvation that you have. So that you can come be with me and live with me forever. I'm going to the cross for you. And he did. And how do I accept that? I say, Jesus, I believe you went to the cross. You died for me. And that your spirit will come live in my heart. And that you will come live in me. And I in you, if I ask you, if I ask you to forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save me so you'll do it. And have. My little old testimony, November 5th, 3 o'clock in the morning, 1972. Drunk as a skunk, wrecked my car, and I said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. Never took another drink and never swore another cuss word from that day to this. A total changed man. When Jesus knocked Paul off of his donkey out there in the desert and said to him, Hey, man, I need you. I need a man like you. I need a man with your fervor. I need a man that will get out here and do what you're doing. For me. The right way. See, Paul was doing right religiously. The religious way he was doing it was right religiously. But he had to do it right spiritually. And so, so God spoke to him. Verse 28. And nothing terrified by your adversary, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and of God. This is the salvation of Jesus Christ through the cross. By just making that statement. And you have that salvation. And uh, through the cross. Having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here by me, in me. You will have conflict. You will have conflict. If you're in this world, and you follow Jesus Christ, you will have conflict. This conflict doesn't have to be a defeating conflict. Doesn't have to take you out of the game. It's the very thing can woo you on in the game. When you come strongly up to somebody and get to talking to them about Jesus, and they say, just, just look, 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 man. Get out of here. I don't want to hear it. I don't want nothing to do with that, with Jesus or with that stuff. I've seen too much, too many Pharisees. I've seen too many people. He said, Church is slap full of hypocrites. Just people that say this and say that. And they go down there Sunday morning and they go drink beer with me on Monday night. They cuss and swear on the job. They do this and they do that. I'm sad to say, but that's true. There are many that do that. They sit in churches, but they're not Christians. They're church going people, but they're not Christians. A Christian is a person who strives to act Christ-like, who strives to follow Jesus as his Lord and Savior and his Master. That's what a Christian is. Uh, a church-going man does not make him a Christian. Because he goes to church doesn't make him a Christian. What makes him a Christian? He said with his mouth and believed in his heart the Lord Jesus 
and he changed his ways. And now he walks totally opposite of what he walked in that day. Well, our time has come and gone, and we'll see you next time. This is Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. Have a good day. Bye-bye.